This is Rock Talk with Mitch LaFawn. Mitch LaFawn. Welcome to this special episode of Rock Talk with Mitch LaFawn. I have vocalist from Iron Maiden and author of the book, What Does This Button Do? The one, the only Bruce Dickinson. I'm not going to give you a whole lot of talk up because I think if you're listening, you know who Bruce is. I know who Bruce is, and we want to hear Bruce talk. Uh, I'll give you a quick uh, heads up on this. The interview, the audio, when Bruce was talking, uh, for some reason, at the beginning of the interview, the first few minutes, there was a bit of a clicking sound on the audio, not terribly distracting. I certainly can get through it. And then uh, towards the end, the phone connection totally cleared up and it's absolutely perfect. But uh, just to let you know that at the beginning, you're going to hear when Bruce is talking, uh, a couple of clicking sounds from the phone connection. I, I'm assuming that it's either cell phone connection or, or Skype that was uh, doing that to us. But either way, the content of the interview is fantastic. So please check out my interview with Bruce Dickinson and what does this button do? Here's Bruce. We are speaking with Iron Maiden vocalist Bruce Dickinson. What does this button do is the new autobiography bruce a great great pleasure uh, to speak with you um not the first time but always something i look forward to well thank you very much so uh, talk to me about this book what does this button do um because that's the title of the book but it's also the last line in the book and as you go through it and you see the different stories it seems to be sort of your 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 theme or your motto that that there's this childlike sort of innocence to discovery and adventure. Is is that sort of how you see it and how that title reflects your life? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think um, uh, you know when, when I, I started writing the book, um, uh, you know, this is a book. It's a book about my life, not just about. Um, you know, I'm Raiden. Um, so obviously, there's I've done all kinds of things, some of which people know about, some of which don't. But the the aim of the book was not to do a, you know, um, uh, you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll, and decadence, and all the rest of it. Lots of people do that, and that's actually not really who I am. So um, this is more a book about celebrating life, about trying to lift people up rather than grind them down, um, and uh, also about not taking yourself uh, 100% seriously all of the time. You know, take, take life with a pinch of salt, take it with a sense of humor, but above all, you know, don't let it squish you. You know, get, get, you, know you fall off the horse, get back on, you know? Yeah, and, and, and that seems to be how you sort of approach things. Um, let me look at some of the things in particular here that, that we talk about. Um, 1994. You talk about this gig in Sarajevo. There's a documentary going to be coming out called Scream for Me, Sarajevo. Uh, that, that sort of what does this button do approach to life seems to be uh, relevant there in the sense that here's this war zone and nothing sort of held you back. You decide, OK, I'm going to go do this because those fans need to see me. Talk to me about that gig and and looking back on it, do you sort of think, oh, my God, that was so dangerous. What, what was I thinking? Um, uh, yeah, a little bit, actually. Um, but it, it, was, it, was, it was a genuinely life-changing moment for me. Um, I think it was probably more life-changing for the people that, that saw the show. Um, and that's what was so, so touching about the... Um, the documentary that, that the Sarajevo people have made. Um, I mean, I was completely unaware that they were, they were doing it until somebody came up to me in my local pub and said, uh, oh, hi, I'm from Sarajevo. I've got a film to show you. Uh, and I went, oh, hey, what were you talking about? You know, And, of course, then I discovered that they'd gone in and they'd, they'd researched... Uh, not just the equipment that we used to get in there, as in the, the this ancient soft top truck that we drove in through the um, across this big mountain that was a you know basically a, yeah it was a, a war zone. There was actually a, a firefight going on on top of it um, a few minutes before we uh, we crossed over. Anyway, um, the point was that they interviewed 
or kids who are now obviously no longer kids 20 years later. And the, it was, there was some just heartbreaking stories of deprivation and, and, and what it was like to live in a city that was under siege for longer than the siege of Stalingrad, you know? Um, and this was supposedly in a part of Western Europe where, hey, everything's supposed to be civilized and this stuff doesn't go on. Well, you know, it does, and it's still going on. This, you know, people are still um, banging on about it now with some justification, you know, uh, because there are war criminals out there who are still being arrested. Yeah, they are. And uh, but was there a certain... But looking back, though, do you see a certain foolishness in, in, in doing that, or do you look back on it with great pride in the sense that those people really well, needed that well, uplifting? Well, well, the, well, well, the answer is, I think, both. You know, uh, um, at, at the time, uh, it was uh, it, it, looking at it rationally, uh, dispassionately, and, uh, you know, with uh, health and safety and uh, all the rest of it, uh, yeah, it was a damn stupid thing to do. But you know what? Sometimes the best things to do are damn stupid things to do. So uh, I don't regret it for a second. Yeah. Um, your voice. You're, you're known, of course, as the air raid siren and singing and, and all this wonderful stuff. You credit in the book Tony Platt, the, engin- the uh, sound engineer and the song Riding with Angels. Um, talk to me about Tony Platt. What, what, what did he bring to your vocal style that changed you from just being a guy that sings to being the singer? Uh, well, um, obviously, you know, I think Tony was one, Tony was one step along the way. I mean, he wasn't the whole answer, but, but he opened out my voice in a way which I would never have, I would never have taken a chance on, on stressing my voice to the extent that he, he made me push it. Uh, and so I discovered bits of my, my range, my, my upper register, which I would never have gone anywhere near because, you know, frankly, I thought I might damage it, you know? And in fact, um, for the first, uh, you know, few months after I did that album, um, I could, I, I really was at a loss on how I was going to, uh, reproduce the songs, uh, live. Uh, because after you know singing them in in clubs and things like that, where maybe the sound wasn't so great, you know, I would lose my voice after after a couple of days. So I was in, I was in a state of despair, and then I I realised that, that that what I actually had was I did have a certain amount of of vocal technique which I boned up on in libraries and practicing, and I went maybe this is the time to sit down, don't panic, and, and try and bring that vocal technique to bear in reproducing what obviously is a noise coming out of your mouth that people like, you know. Um, so, so that's what I did, and uh, it, it was um, uh, that then led into me kind of accepting it and then going, you know, actually, I could really go places with this voice that, I, I didn't think I could go before um, in terms of tones, in terms of different notes and melodies and things. And then when I, you know, really got clued into the idea that maybe Iron Maiden might be, might be an option, I thought, wow, if I could glue this voice onto that guitar and bass attack, wow, it could be something really unique, you know? Yeah, and it turned out to be unique. Talk to me about then, because you just mentioned Iron Maiden, and, and about you saw them at a gig, and you saw them do the song Prowler, as you recount in, in the book, and you say, I knew I was going to be their singer. Where did that confidence come from, and, and how did you know? I mean, it's you know, it's it's... I don't want to say uh, obnoxious, but it's sort of like, hey. Um, talk to me about that and that, that sort of epiphany where you went, yeah, this one's for me. These guys are for me. Um, well, you know, you get certain moments, like the first time I heard Deep Purple playing behind the closed door, and I was like, wow, what is that noise, you know? And the first time I saw Maiden was actually, uh, uh, well, in actual fact, it was a show. We were playing the show uh, later on, in actual fact, theoretically, we were headlining, uh, but 50% of the people turned up to see Maiden. 
Um, and I was just in the audience watching from the back. And the power of that band reminded me exactly of that sort of, that purple moment. But it, it wasn't like purple. It was like purple just kind of like updated um, for the latter half of the 20th century. And I just went, if I sing with that band, with that, wow, if I was fronting that band, that would just be unbelievable what we could do together. My voice, that band, you know. And um, so I was kind of, in the, in the back of my mind, I was like, this, this is... This is going to happen one day. I can just feel it in my bones. I mean, the, the drummer was uh, pretty close. I was fairly close with the band anyway because Shock Tactics, we recorded in the same stu- next door studio to Maiden when they recorded Killers. You know, so it wasn't like we didn't know each other. It wasn't like they didn't know the kind of singing I was doing. And it was, you know, frankly, there was a little bit of stress showing. Uh, with Paul at that point. And I was, I thought, you know, I, I, I can't see this situation lasting. I thought, this, you know, wow. It's like when you see a girl sometimes and you go, I'm going to marry you. <laughs> and that makes no, it's no, ra- it's not rational. It doesn't make any sense, but there's a connection. And it was that kind of a connection. Yeah. And it, and it certainly worked out. Um, let me talk to you about the writing style of the book here for a second, because I've read a lot of these books over the years, and I have to be frank, most of them I really just dislike. Yours I love for the fact that it's not boastful, it's not settling of accounts, it's very matter-of-fact, there, there's, there's sort of a, a wry humor to it. Talk to me about putting the book together and the approach to the writing style. Why not settle scores? Why not call out people? And why not brag about the drinking and the this and, but you didn't do that. You kept it very sort of stately. Um, talk to me about that, that, that sort of artistic vision of putting this book together. Well, well, first of all, I, I, I made the decision that I wanted the book to be, uh, uplifting. I wanted the book to be about the good stuff that is, you know, music that is my life. Um, there's no point in, in, you know, taking cheap shots at people. First of all, uh, I think it gives it gives uh, it gives people a ridiculous amount of power and importance that they don't possess any other way. So, you know, if people, I mean, I had people coming up to me saying, "I hope I I'd better be in your book," and I didn't have the heart to tell them they weren't important enough. You know, um, because the important things in your life are the things that happen to you the first time, and they're the things that inspire you. And I'm not interested in, 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 in dragging things down to the level of the gutter and beyond. There's, there's plenty of stuff like that on reality television, and it's just like some strange cancer that pervades the airwaves. And I think it eats away at people's souls, you know? And this is a book I wanted to write because I thought, you know, my life has been wonderful. I've really loved it. And what I love about it is the fact that I never lose that childish optimism, that there's something you can learn every day. There's something you can extract, the joy that's there. And um, that's why the book is written the way it is. I mean, I, I, I sometimes take things really seriously, but you know what? Even the things I take seriously... I can laugh about, and that's something that in Maiden we have in common. You know, people people think we must be terribly serious heavy metal musicians, and yeah, we are serious about what we do, um, but we're not serious uh, about who we are. You know, we're not. You know, uh, I absolutely can't stand. They are the worst. Bo- they're the most boring people on the planet. It's rock stars who take themselves massively, massively seriously. You know. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's great fun. It's a privilege to do the job. Uh, but come on, you know, um, it could be worse. You know, you could have cancer. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Well, I, I <laughs> do want to... There's the last chapter, you know. Yeah, I, and I do want to get to the cancer, but, but I do have to say in terms of the book, I, you, you know, when somebody sends me a book like this to read, I dread reading them because I think, oh, here we go again. You know, I was so good. I had so many women. I did this. But this one, just chapter after chapter, just kept you 
intrigued and wanting to read more and more and more. So, so just, you know, well I, done. I, 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 well, thank you. Thank you. Cause I mean, I, I've got, I've got a confession to make. I, I don't read, um, uh, autobiographies. Yeah. I'm and I don't to. read them <laughs> for that exact same reason that you get given them and dread reading them because I did a little bit of research on this. I, I turned down writing this for about 10, 15 years. Um, because I was just like, oh, God, you know, they're going to want some tedious tell-all about this. I said, it's re- this stuff is really dull, narcissistic, and boring, you know. It, it, and that's the worst crime. The worst crime you can have is, it's boring, you know. And so I, I went to, you know, bookstores, and I, I pulled a few books at random from the shelf. And just, I was like... This is so, t- these, these people, are <laughs> so tedious, you know, um, and it's exactly what you were describing. Um, and, it, and it was like making, you know, talking about making a mountain out of a molehill, um, you know, out, out of nothing, they would extract all this drama. And then, and then, you know, because, I don't know, because my makeup was smudged then you know, I threw a, a fit and they took away my Lamborghini or something. I was just like, you know, what, what kind of rubbish is this? You know? And then I thought back to a book that really inspired me when I was a kid. And it was a book by an actor. Um, he's long dead now, bless him. But David Niven, yes. um, who was an English uh, actor. Uh, and he, and he, had a, he had a very wry sense of humor. And he told these wonderful stories about, you know, going out and getting drunk with, with um, uh, you know, with Errol Flynn. But it wasn't about getting drunk. It was about the, the joy and the lunacy of the whole thing. And it was done in such a beautiful way and so stylishly told. And I thought, I would love to write a book that was even halfway approaching that book. The book was called The, the Moon's a Balloon. And I had that in the back of my mind when I, I, I started writing this, you know. Yeah, and I and I think you you fully succeeded because it actually is just such a great read. Um, even if you're not a fan of Iron Maiden, by the way, it's a great read. Um, you, you well, t- that, that, and, and that was that was the, one of the intentions is that is that I wanted to 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 try and pull in people uh, who who might who might only be peripheral fans or dimly aware um, that there was a band called Iron Maiden, you know. Uh, and that it might just be that, you know, as, as I was, when I was a kid, you know, I would never normally read a biography or an autobiography by a, um, a Hollywood film star that was in his, in his, almost in his seventies by then. But everybody came up to me and said, you've got to read this book. It's just such a great book. And they were right, you know. So if I've gotten even close, I'd be delighted. Yeah, you really are. Um, I do want to touch on the cancer, uh, but I see we're, we're down to 10 minutes. So let me throw a few rapid questions at you, and then we'll get to, to, to that topic. Um, you talked about important people in your life. Rod Smallwood and Steve Harris have been part of your life for, what, four decades, five decades now? What what has oh, Rod? Oh yeah, a long a, lo- a long time. A long time, and and I've had a chance to sit with Rod, and 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 I've spoken to him. I've even met you actually backstage in in Montreal. Um, but what does it, you know? Because in in this business, managers and business managers and tour, we sort of run through them like dirty socks. But you've stuck with them. What is it about Rod that sort of says, yeah, he's the guy that's going to guide this ship or help us guide this ship. And why not just cast them away at the end of every tour cycle, like a lot of bands do? Yeah, well, there's, 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 there's several elements to all this. The, the first one is that Maiden is not like a lot of bands. Um, Maiden is is truly unique, not just because, yeah, sure, every band has kind of unique music. Yeah, we write our own songs, blah blah blah. No, it's not that. Um, Maiden means so much to so many people over so many years that it's it's hard to it's hard to describe to somebody who's not experienced it, who's not had their life changed or touched by us in some way. And one of the people that epitomizes that is Rod, because he is the heart and soul of the integrity that accompanies the music that we do. Um 
And um, without him, uh, I think that, you know, there's always a chance that Maiden would, you know, maybe have been tempted to go down the path of being, you know, just kind of another, just kind of another band. Um, and he's absolutely put his stamp on the integrity and the course that the ship should sail. Now, Steve does a similar thing, but musically, um, Rod is not how would I, not what I would describe as a, a, a musical manager. Uh, he's an, he's an, he has a, an artistic input and he has some opinions with which we often disagree. But the point is, is that the opinions are all there for the right reasons, even if sometimes we execute them in a different way. And it's all about integrity. It's all about the truthfulness of what we do and, and being true to that vision. Um, that, you know, we are a band that is created um, by, you know, our audience, if you like. They give us the permission to exist, but we don't ask their permission to create. We do that on our own, and we hope that they follow us on the journey, uh, for better or worse, you know. Um, They certainly have. And he's been (laughs) instrumental in, you know, he's been instrumental in doing that for us. Uh, just quickly on, on, on fans that follow you, I'm from uh, Montreal, and Quebec City and Montreal have been sort of die-hard Iron Maiden fans from the early, early days. Uh, what what does this place hold for you in terms of when you come here and when you put a show on at you know the Plain d'Abraham or at the Bell Center? Is there just a, a special energy, and is there a special connection to, to Quebec and Montreal? Um, well, I, I, I think there is, and, and one of them is that when I, when I very first came uh, to uh, the USA and Canada on the Number of the Beast tour, you know, I mean, bear in mind, I'd, I, I'd barely been outside of, of of England before, you know, like about twice I'd crossed the channel on the ferry, that was it, and suddenly I'm going around the world and I end up in the USA, which was like, okay, this is a little bit different. And then I end up in Canada, which is, wow, so this, this is kind of, uh, you know, a, a little bit y- y- European. I kind of I understand where these people are coming from, and more, much more so than, than some places in, like, Detroit and America, where people were nice. But Canada, they had the same, there was chunks of the same cultural things that I understood. And then, of course, we go to Quebec, and Quebec uh, uh, welcomed me because they hadn't, really see anything else and we were headlining and the other crazy thing was that I could speak French yeah. uh, or at least to the audience and suddenly that that bond I don't think has ever really been shaken except maybe by my shaken, shaky French <laughs> yeah. yeah bonjour Quebec I've seen a few of those shows um, and then just before I get to the uh, the question about the, the, the cancer stuff when you came back to Iron Maiden, you chose to sing some of the Blaze Bailey songs, Man on the Edge, Future Real, Sign of the Cross, The Klansman, and I always thought that that was very gracious of you because it sort of lent a credence to what had been done when you weren't there, and unlike some singers, you know, uh, and I, well, you know, I don't want to name names, but there were other bands where other singers where they refused to sing songs. Um, why was that decision made and, and uh, you know, just why not just get back in the band and say, well, I'm back and we're only going to sing the stuff that I'm known for. Why was that sort of... <laughs> well, well, you know, life's too short to go around, you know, uh, chucking your ego around like that. It's just, it's, it's childish, you know, it's stupid. And, uh, and actually, you know, some of the, some of the songs, some of the songs kind of worked, some of them didn't, but you know what? They were all songs, um, which a lot of Iron Maiden fans bought. And some of them, in particular, like Clownsman um, and Sign of the Cross, I think we really nailed those songs. Uh, and I thought they were great. It was great material, you know. I mean, and, and uh, you know, Blazer's voice obviously was quite different to mine. It was a slightly lower register. Um, so, uh, and actually, I wasn't complaining, you know, because I could use this kind of lower kind of baritone 
tone to there and, and, and get quite kind of robust on it all. And I really enjoyed singing those songs. Uh, and I think that, um, uh, it's, you know, it, it, Blaze, I, I had the utmost respect for Blaze because he stepped into a situation that was, it, gosh, I mean, extremely difficult for him, you know, because, you know, manifestly his voice was so different to mine and yet he had to try and, and sing some of those songs. Um, so, um, you know, he was, he was in a difficult place and he was a very, very nice guy and still is a very nice guy, you know, and I have a huge amount of respect for him, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in... Uh, around 2015 or so, you did an interview with The Guardian, and you said, hell would have to freeze over before you couldn't get me on that stage, even if somebody else had to sing, and all I could do is run around and wave my fucking arms. Um, that, sort of em- that, sort of, right, that sort of emphasizes, though, how you approached uh, the whole cancer situation. It wasn't about being defeated or about giving up. It was about, listen... We're going to do this. We're going to get through it. Um, talk to me about cancer. Talk to me about Dr. Amen Sibtain, uh, who you called in the book a magician. Um, did you sort of face that on with a an expectation of success, or were there real moments of fear where you sat back and went, oh, fuck, this this is going to be, I can't do this? Um, well, the, the that last idea that, you know, hey, shit, I can't do this, um, you you don't get the option to say that because you are doing it, <laughs> and 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 by the time you shovel yourself full of chemo and uh, and and you're getting radiation, uh, you know, thirty three days of radiation over you know whatever you know five days a week, you really you you just don't get the option to to give up. Um, the there's lots of things about it which uh, were, you know, quite uh, unpleasant that, that I, you know, write about in the book. But actually, the, the sort of the fear bit, the, oh, my God, I might die, um, happened to me right at the beginning. And, and actually, I realized that it, I wasn't dying any time soon. You sort of step back and go, what you're scared of is the uncertainty of what the outcome of this might be. But the chances are that the outcome might be okay. Um, and I obviously I did all my research and I Googled away and I, I figured that in, in reality my chances were like 60-40 um, that I would get away with it uh, because uh, we didn't know what the cause of the tumor was. But if it was uh, a human papillomavirus-related tumor, actually my chances went up to 60, 80%, you know? And the big problem I would have would be reading and talking to other people, actually recovering from the treatment itself if we got rid of the cancer. So on Christmas Eve... I got this phone call. I was doing some Christmas shopping, you know, and I got the phone call from my doc saying good news about the bad news. It turns out like pretty much 90% of all these cancers now in, in, in men and women, it was a HPV related cancer. He said that puts you in a whole different percentage survival. And I went, was I like 60, 40 before? He went, uh, yeah. I went, okay, doc, you know, so I started to feel a lot more optimistic, but still it's the unknown that you don't know. And yeah, it, 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 it does, it, it does rip bits of your body apart going through all this stuff. Um, and I was extremely lucky. I was fit, fat, healthy, and well before I started and because I never smoked and because, you know, I was pretty determined, um, I think that that really helps uh, uh, get through. But I've met lots of men since I had the treatment and since, obviously, it became public knowledge. I've met lots, and I mean lots. I mean 20 or 30 men who've all had 
exactly the same cancer. At this point, the uh, phone gave out on us, but I got Bruce right back on the phone. And as bonus, the clicking stopped. So here is, once again, Bruce Dickinson. Hi again, Bruce. Hi there. I'm not sure what happened there. Where did, where did we get to? I said I was saying something, and then... Um, um, but anyway, just recap briefly then. So, so I, you know, it, it was it was the fear of, of of what the outcome might be. I, I I knew that you know it was a an HPV related cancer, which right. actually gave me some wow. This this gives me something to hang on to. And funnily enough, I read a kind of a blog from the Environment Minister for Canada. Right. And he had exactly the same tumor. And he was in his 70s, I think, or early, like getting on uh, older than me. And he wrote this matter of fact blog saying it was just me. And I just turned up and had my radiation and went home and got on with it, just like everybody else, like thousands of other people every day. And I went, that's the best. That was one of the best things I read about it and I went I just let's just get on with it let's just I treat it like a, I treat it like a job I treat it like I treat anything else I treat it like making an album I you go there and you just get on with it and you take every day as it comes until you get to the end of it and then you see what happens and there's nothing I can do other than do that just roll with the punches and go with it and that's where I find that that quote from The Guardian so inspiring. Uh, and we'll finish with this because I know our time is up. Um, the voice, though, now is, is doing okay. There, there's no sort of secondary effects. You're, you're, you're able to do the shows without all kinds of cortisone or, or pills. Or Is Bruce sort of okay to do Oh, my God, do... I've never, ever. Okay. I... Oh, Ch- the, the, yes. you, you said the C word there, the cortisone word. Yeah. Um, I, I I do not take that ever, not ever, right. right? If you need cortisone to do a show, you should not be doing the show, right? So it's just, it, 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 it's like sitting, taking cortisone for your voice is like sitting on a branch with a saw and sawing through the branch every day saying, well, oh, uh, everything seems to be working okay. I'll just take another cut out of the branch here until eventually it snaps. And you fall off. The, no, it's a disaster. Um, oh. So, um, no, I do the shows. Uh, the best thing you can say is uh, uh, the live album. Uh, just listen to the live album. Oh, that's right. There's no <laughs> I have, I, I have no it right next to me and forgot to no ask nothing. about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry. Well, the, that live album, we, we did the tour, and uh, that was, a lot of those... Uh, Concerts were actually, I think, from the, the, the might have been from the beginning a bit of it. But anyway, we um, they just said, uh, "Oh, they're going to do a live album." I'm like, "Oh, cool, okay." And then the next thing, it turned up. So, so I I listened to it and I thought, "Wow, <laughs> this sounds kind of good." Yeah. <laughs> um, and I was delighted with it. I, I was thinking the voice, the voice sounds great. I mean. Okay, I make a little bit less saliva now than I used to, so I've got little bottles of water lurking around the stage. Yeah, well, what do you do? Big deal. Um, and uh, a little bit on certain vowel sounds in the lower lower part of my register, I sometimes notice the voice can sometimes be a little bit unstable. Um, uh, but that seems to be getting better, but it's just over time. But nobody else notices. Nobody else. It's like, well, we don't notice the difference. I'm like, well, okay, cool. But the the top notes, and this is the most bizarre thing, the top notes are bigger and, could I say, just need less effort, which yeah. is extraordinary, and I can't tell you why. Yeah, that's amazing. And and by the way, so I, I I started off by saying for every question I'd ask, there's a hundred I wouldn't ask. And of course, the Book of Souls live chapter, which I have right next to me, I totally forgot to ask about. Um, Bruce, a great pleasure. And yeah. uh, I'll finish with this. I saw uh, in the book you mentioned Glass Tiger and uh, how they broke up his knee and stuff. So I asked Alan Frew, who I'm friends with, if uh, Bruce 
broke his knees on, on playing soccer, and, and he said no, but Alan wanted me to make sure I said hello to you for him, so there you go. Uh, hello from Alan Fru from Glass Tiger. <laughs> and, uh, he, was, he, he, was, he was stretching off, I think. He, he tripped over, I think it was the, the pitch, actually, that, uh, that uh, he, put his, he twisted his foot. I'm pretty sure he, was, he, he went off injured. Well, he actually sent me a note, if you want, I'll, I can read it, it's about two lines at, uh, about what happened. He sent me a note on it. Yeah. Your, he said, uh, no, I had been up all night shooting oh. a video in video, uh, sorry, I'd been shooting a video in boots with higher than heels, uh, kind of cowboy heels, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I was on concrete all night and my knee was twinged during the game at one point, it caved in on me, I came off and instead they strapped it back off and let me play. Later, I turned quickly and it snapped my ACL, my meniscus, and my medial collateral ligaments, the big three, and I was leaving to tour the U.S. the next day. Only choice was a full leg cast for which I performed until I couldn't stand, and then they cut it off, and I finished the tour in Atlanta in a brace and had major surgery. There you go. <laughs> That's what he said. Oh, my God. That, that well, yeah, you know, so <laughs> it's... I wasn't entirely wrong. <laughs> no, no. I just sort of hobbling around and thought, shit, you know, you know, uh, okay, ma- wow. Boy, I, I, don't, uh, I don't envy him that. That's, uh, that. that sounded horrendous. No, that the, uh, the triple header of the ACL, the meniscus, and the uh, medial collateral all, all on one and then having a tour the next day, that's, yeah. <laughs> That'll do it for you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Bruce, great pleasure. Yeah. Uh, always love seeing yeah. you in uh, Quebec and in Montreal. And of course, uh, Alan says hello. Like I said, and uh, there you go. And I could I could ask you another million questions, Fantastic. but I know our time is up. But merci beaucoup. Now we ah uh, well we can do that we can do that if I come around Canada to uh, to talk about the book. So you never know. <laughs> I would certainly hope uh, it might happen. <laughs> well, let's let's do a let's do a part two. There's there's so many things not yeah. covered, and uh, you know, merci merci. Uh, you know. Merci beaucoup. Yeah. Cheers. Oui, merci beaucoup. Au revoir, Canada. Yes. <laughs> à bientôt. À bientôt. <laughs> Bye-bye now. You're listening to Rock Talk with Mitch LaFond. Rock Talk.